the International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast, episode four, Burgess and his world. Anthony Burgess's beginnings were characteristically swathed in self-created myth. According to a family tree that Burgess wrote and did not publish in his lifetime, his genetic line is a suitably Burgessian construct. The blood of Bonnie Prince Charlie mixes with a Shakespearean boy player, Irish Catholics, a Scottish music hall singer, and salt-of-the-earth Mancunians. Born John Burgess Wilson in 1917, he was brought up in three working-class areas of Manchester, Harper Hay, Miles Platting, and Moss Side. When talking about Burgess's early life, much of the information is dubiously changeable. By some of his autobiographical accounts, his mother, Elizabeth Burgess, was a Scottish singer and dancer. In others, she was a Lancastrian who performed at the Ardwick Empire. Joseph Wilson, Burgess's father, was putatively a piano player of some talent, but also held the jobs of cashier, tobacconist and shopkeeper. What is certain is that Elizabeth died, along with Burgess's elder sister in the flu pandemic of 1918, leaving the 21-month-old John to be raised solely by his father. He describes his relationship with his father in Little Wilson and Big God. My father's attitude to his son must now have become too complicated for articulation. It would have been neater if all three in that room had been obliterated. When I was old enough to appreciate his mingled resentment and facetious gratitude at my survival, I was able to understand his qualified affection, his lack of interest in any future I might have, the ill-considered second marriage, which was a way of getting me off his hands. Joseph's second wife, named Maggie Dwyer and not much liked by the young Burgess, already had two daughters from another marriage. Burgess was moved into the rooms above the Golden Eagle pub in Miles Platting, owned by his stepmother's family, and started misbehaving. In his autobiography, he tells of micturating in all of the pub's chamber pots, sometimes splashing the carpet, and drawing pictures of his hated stepmother, complete with male genitalia. Maggie would gain notoriety in Burgess's fiction, particularly as the inspiration for F.X. Enderby's grotesque stepmother. Oh, she had been graceless and coarse, that one. A hundredweight of ringed and broached blubber, smelling to high heaven of female smells, rank as long-hung hair or blown beef. Her bedroom strewn with soiled bloomers, crummy combinations, malodorous bus bodices. She had swollen finger joints, puffy palms, wrists girdled with fat, slug white upper arms that when naked showed indecent as thighs. She was corned, bunioned, calloused, varicose veined, healthy as a sow. She moaned of pains in all her joints, a perpetual migraine, a bad back, toothache. Her habits were loathsome. She picked her teeth with old tram tickets, cleaned out her ears with hair clips in whose U-bend earwax was trapped to darken and harden. Scratched her private parts through her clothes with a matchbox rasping noise audible two rooms away. Belched like a ship in the fog, was sick on stout on Saturday nights, trombone vigorously in the lavatory, ranted without H's or grammar, scoffed at books except old Moore's almanac, whose apocalyptic pictures she could follow. Literally illiterate all her life. She would sign cheques by copying her name from a prototype on a greasy piece of paper, drawing it carefully as a Chinese draws an ideogram. Despite these rather unhappy memories of his childhood, Burgess remained fiercely Mancunian. During his time at Zavarian College in the Victoria Park area of the city, he was taught elocution and lost the drawl of a Manchester accent but he remained faithful to what he saw as provincial roots. Here is Burgess talking about his formative years, away from the cultural hub of London. You see, look at it this way. I don't come from London, I come from Manchester. 
I come from a town not far from Liverpool where the Beatles come from. In other words, I'm a provincial. Uh, I was brought up to speak with a provincial accent, you know, like, you know, speaking like that, you know, in that manner, not the way I'm speaking to you, because you could probably not understand what I'd be saying if I spoke in that manner all the time. But that's the way I was brought up to speak. Uh, you could not tolerate the notion of being cut off from the mainstream. You know, there we are up in Manchester, OK, we can have our own little provincial culture, our own little provincial theatres, our provincial orchestra, but the, the, action's down, the action is down there in London. And, of course, the action is there. With the, its name is New York. The action's there with, like, you want to be noticed. Now, I've never been noticed, I feel. I, I, I feel that the, my, my mother has let me down in that I have not been to Oxford, I have not been to Cambridge, I have not been to Eton, I have not been to Harrow. I've missed those initial opportunities uh, which um, produced a ruling class. You know, the ruling class in England came from there. And it's still true in England that if you're not um, an Oxford graduate or a Cambridge graduate, uh, you're not of much account. If you're a Manchester graduate or a graduate of Exeter University, which, of course, is your is your twin in England, is it not? Mm -hmm. Kenyon's yes, twin. Right. And this is, this is not terribly important to the world. And if we come from a provincial background, we can't help feeling resentful that this uh, other establishment uh, wedge of society has got all the plums and we've been left out. As his life took him further away from Manchester, Burgess would not only mythologize his childhood in the city, but also the city itself. For Burgess, Manchester was a spiritual home, even though he never properly returned after leaving in 1940. The city acted as a centre that his nomadic life revolved around. In 1984, Burgess portrayed the city in parallel to his international existence. But there were enough foreigners in Manchester to temper the spirit of the hard-headed North. The girl I first fell in love with was Italian, the second was Jewish and German. When Hitler began his pogroms, Manchester was one of the first British cities to welcome an influx of German refugees. It is a cosmopolitan city still, with its African and Arab banks, but so are all British towns these days. Before the war, it was selectively cosmopolitan, in that it was European. In many ways, it was a kind of outlying centre of Europe, foretelling the future of a whole continent. This supposedly Mancunian openness to other cultures is something that characterises Burgess's life. When, in 1940, he was taken away from his home city by the Second World War, it would have a profound impact on both his life and his writing. His first experience of foreign living came in 1943, when he was posted to Gibraltar as part of the Army Education Corps. During the war, Gibraltar was a target for the Germans who viewed it as a highly prized tactical base. However, Spain's neutral status and its reluctance to allow German troops onto their soil thwarted their efforts, making Gibraltar a relatively safe posting for Burgess. With this safety, however, came boredom and isolation. Burgess's experience in Gibraltar influenced the novel A Vision of Battlements, which tells of Sergeant Richard Ennis, a teacher in the Army Education Corps who really wants to be a composer and is at rebellious odds with the hierarchical military structure. This novel was the first Burgess ever wrote, though it remained unpublished until 1965. In his introduction, he explains why he was compelled to write it. There was another submerged motive for writing, and that was to see if I could clear my head of the dead weight of Gibraltar. I had lived with it so long that it still lay in my skull, a chronic migraine. A work of fiction seemed the best way of breaking it up, pulverising it, sweeping it away. But to my surprise, the act of recomposing the rock and of reconstructing the artificial life that was lived around it served only to call back the pain and loneliness that refused to be exorcised. I pushed on to the end, but then made little effort to seek publication. The typescript travelled to Malaya and Borneo with me, then back to England, always pushed into drawers, but, so loath is the artist to waste anything, never actually condemned to destruction. Despite this foray into fiction writing, Burgess began his post-war life by continuing to ply his trade in teaching. 
From 1950 until 1954, his students were not squaddies, but the children of Banbury Grammar School. Burgess taught English, where his enthusiasm for literature inspired his pupils, but he grew disenchanted with Oxfordshire life. In the evenings, he used to drink cheap cider and apply for jobs he read about in advertisements. Unwittingly, he applied for a teaching job in Malaya, although he had no memory of writing the letter. Nevertheless, this application was successful, and he sailed for the mysterious East in 1954. The Malaya of the 1950s was in crisis. The national state of emergency was effectively a civil war fought between Commonwealth forces and the Malayan National Liberation Army, the military wing of the Malayan Communist Party. Burgess and his wife, Lynn, were entering into a zone of guerrilla warfare, but he only ever really experienced the troubles distantly. Burgess's knowledge of the Far East came from his interest in literature, Somerset Maugham, George Orwell, Joseph Conrad, and of course, Rudyard Kipling. This was his first time outside of Europe, and Burgess remembers it with fondness, writing of the beautiful mornings spent with papaya and eggs and bacon and strong British tea. He also writes of the magical nights of a huge moon over the mystic jungle. This poetic vision, however, often gives way to horror. The garden was full of snakes, of which Malaya has a large variety, and a king cobra with a growing family was much round King's Pavilion during my tenure. Scorpions would get into the boys' shoes or beds and sting them bitterly. Hygiene was a problem, for the water supply was erratic and sometimes totally failed. Because of some fault in the meter, the water department recorded excessive use in a dry time when, in fact, there was no water at all. My complaints and counter-complaints were rebuffed. I groaned in my stomach. I had the reputation of being bloody-minded. It was the army all over again. Despite this love-hate relationship with Malaya, Burgess felt a responsibility to learn the language and treat the local population with respect. He disliked the head teacher of Malay College, Jimmy Howell, because according to Burgess, he refused to learn the language. Yet in the collection at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation, there is Howell's copy of Colloquial Malay, which has been well read and annotated. Burgess's respect for local traditions and the variety of the populace of Malaya is reflected in his series of novels, The Malayan Trilogy. Despite his desire to become a mid-20th century Somerset Maugham, Burgess did not want to emulate Moam's focus on Malaya, the experience of the white, British planters. Burgess was more interested in the kampongs and villages, rather than the colonial gentlemen's clubs, as this extract from the third volume, Beds in the East, shows. Syed Omar lay for an instant debating, caught in an agony of indecision which was no grim pleasure, in common with the rest of the country, he had not absorbed all that much from the West. He could speak English, drive a car, distinguish between brands of brandy, run an office, smell out injustice a mile off, but no white official had ever spoken to him of those philosophies fashionable in post-war Europe. It was all too late now to complete the course. His elected rulers had not heard Toynbee warn of the dangers of sipping rather than draining the West. And now the jungle, after its short doze, was ready to march coastward again. Burgess's interest in learning about the Malay culture, and depicting it truthfully in his fiction, came up against obstacles. He remembers that the white Europeans in Malaya kept themselves away from the locals, and the Malayans themselves had their own opinions about the whites. Sadly, very sadly, a number of the Malay clerks, Chinese businessmen, Sikh railway officials and Tamil civil servants we drank with considered Lin and myself of a breed inferior to the aloof club-frequenting whites because of our desire to be friendly with the natives. One Tamil, who had recently learned the word despicable, said to me, You know, Mr Wilson, you are despicable. Why? because you drink with us people who are known to the white man to be despicable.
Much of this attitude finds its way into Burgess's fiction, yet crucially he tries to capture the Malayan voice in a faithful and ethical way. His characters are no mere caricatures of indigenous races, nor has Burgess removed their capability to speak in their own language. Much of his time in Malaya was spent learning Malay, and he became proficient enough for him to talk fluently with the local population. However, when he came to write the Malayan trilogy, his grasp of the language was to get him in some trouble. In the novels, Burgess fictionalised place names and the names of his characters who were based on real people. For example, Kuala Kangsar, home of Malay College, became Kuala Hantu, or Ghost Estuary. Some of the names Burgess chose do not have so innocent translations. The fictional town Ken Ching translates as urine. Tahi Panas means hot feces. And the character Mr. Mahalingam, whose name would later resurface in Earthly Powers, is Malay for Mr. Large Penis. Complaints to the British publisher were rebuffed with a curt apology, but no promise of removing the book from sale. As the third volume of the trilogy, Beds in the East, was being published, Burgess's time in Malaya had come to an end and he had already taken up another teaching post in Brunei. Unlike Malaya, this turned out to be a rather unhappy time for the Burgesses. His time there ended as unhappily as it began, in 1959. I was teaching one morning when the end of my colonial career was signalled. The class was Form 4, the subject the Boston Tea Party. The fans were not working, and it was rumoured a female cobra was looking for her young in the corridor outside. At the end of the lesson, I felt I had come to the end of my tether. A great deal of tension had been building up. A dissatisfied wife, a libel action, Australians who called me a pommy bastard, a disordered liver, dyspepsia and dyspnea, which morning droplets of axe oil did nothing to alleviate, a very large measure of simple frustration. I had done my best. I could do no more. Let other agencies take over. I lay on the classroom floor and closed my eyes. This incident... Nominally a breakdown due to exhaustion, but mythologised by Burgess as a mysterious terminal illness, was to signal the end of his international life for the next nine years. Yet also it was to signal a period of great productivity and his establishing himself as a professional novelist. He moved to Hove, where he worked on The Doctor is Sick and the first of the Enderby novels, before moving again to Etchingham in Sussex. In 1961, Burgess took the unusual step of visiting Leningrad for a holiday. His experiences in the city would go on to influence Honey for the Bears and the language of A Clockwork Orange. Two years later, Burgess took his first trip to Tangier, a location that would turn up in his novels Enderby Outside and Earthly Powers. Yet Burgess was relatively settled in Etchingham and fell into a routine of writing, drinking both strong tea and gin and smoking up to 80 cigarettes a day. He was at work on novels such as Tremor of Intent Enderby Outside, and his novel about Shakespeare, Nothing Like the Sun. It was not until the death of Lynn in 1968 that Burgess once again began seeking an international existence. One of the reasons for this was because he had met his second wife, Liana Machelari, an Italian translator of literature. In articles for the press, British and American, I announced my intention of leaving England for good. The British, before the dissolution of their empire, had regarded exile as a kind of patriotism. I had gone abroad twice to serve that empire, or what was left of it, and now I proposed serving something bigger, the language which had united it and had produced a great but mostly disregarded literature. There were other reasons for exile. My marriage to a European, my need of light, my disgust with British taxation... This last was presumed to be the one and only reason. To make the declaration at all was pretentious, but it proved to be a kind of anticipatory answer to the attack made on me in the Daily Mirror. I was a rat leaving a sinking ship, it said. Rats are wise to leave sinking ships, but Britain did not seem to be sinking more than usually. There was a kind of rage at a writer's presuming himself to be free, which he is. The only guilt I have felt at leaving England is the guilt of not missing England more.
Burgess targeted Malta as his new home, but before settling he decided to explore Europe in a Bedford Dormobile. His fondness for this nomadic lifestyle led him to call the Dormobile the only home I have ever seriously acknowledged. He felt his travels through France and Italy were a happy and productive time, in which he worked on a film treatment for the first two Enderby novels while Liana drove south. Burgess fictionalised his experience of Malta in earthly powers. The protagonist, Kenneth Toomey, is introduced rattling around his Maltese mansion, remembering his past as a satellite member of the Pope's family. Malta, for Toomey, is a place of frustration, with its draconian censorship laws and endless bureaucracy. When Toomey is waylaid in Rome after an unfortunate hospitalisation, the Maltese government exile his servant and repossess his home. This can be seen to encapsulate Burgess's frustrations with the island state. Burgess expressed his dislike of the Maltese censorship laws in a lecture to the Malta Library Association in 1970. One cannot always win. I wrote a book, which has already been mentioned rather cleverly by your chairman, Tremor of Intent, which is in fact on sale here in a Penguin edition in Malta, but it was held up at the post office, at least not allowed to be lent by me to anybody, because it came out in French, and French is ipso facto a suspicious language. The book, incidentally, is about a spy who became a priest. Simple as that. When the book came out in Danish, called Martyrenis Blood, which means martyr's blood, it was almost whizzed through with an archiepiscopal blessing. Eventually, both Burgess and Toomey left Malta, driven out by the state. The lecture Burgess gave, from which we have just heard an extract, was given to an audience of Catholic nuns and priests and contained full-blooded references to the rape and cannibalism of Titus Andronicus and the state of pornography. It altered his position from a distinguished guest of the Maltese to an undesirable villain. After a trip to Italy, Burgess was given the same treatment as Toomey. His house was padlocked and confiscated by the government. Toomey, suffering from old age, returns to his old home in Sussex, but Burgess was to continue his travels, this time to Lake Bracciano in Italy. However, Bracciano never became an official home for the Burgesses. I had come at last to a real country after too much travel and a wretched oppressive island that had not been colonised into civilised polity. I sat at the table by the window in the lakey light and wrote the last chapter of MF. It is set in Bracciano. I was not set, except physically, in Bracciano, I had not applied for Italian residence, and I officially had no Italian money. In 1972, Burgess took up a teaching post at City College in New York, moving with his family into an apartment on West End Avenue. This would also become Enderby's apartment in The Clockwork Testament, published in 1974. Kenneth Toomey also finds himself in New York, seduced into buying a Manhattan apartment by his sleazy agent. Burgess's appointment at City College was largely to do with the success of Stanley Kubrick's A Clockwork Orange. There, one of his colleagues was the American author of Catch-22, Joseph Heller, who saw Burgess as a character of immense generosity. City College was undertaking an experiment in free education, which Heller loathed, but Burgess thought that he could bring about a positive change in the poor students who had enrolled in his classes. Even so, the experiment had its frustrations for Burgess, who thought the students were ignorant and in search of a quick message. During his time living in New York, Burgess travelled around North America to give lectures and appear on radio and television. It was in this period that his fame was at its highest and the producers of television and organisers on the lecture circuit knew that his personality was extremely audience-friendly. It is not hard to see Burgess's experience in forming Kenneth Toomey's realisation in Earthly Powers. I was yielding to the temptation of being the writer as international figure, meaning one who talked more than he wrote. 
There was the medium of television available for the easy projection of inchoate ideas and a pretty well fully formed persona. My persona was mildly liked by television audiences. Its features were recognizable and caricaturable. The ravaged profile, which the cameras loved, the slight lisp, the dogmatic pronouncements on the moors of the post-war world, the occasional assumed ferocity. After New York, Burgess felt that he couldn't return properly to Italy without having to pay both British tax and Italian tax. His solution was to move, in 1974, to Monaco, long a tax haven for the rich and famous. This allowed him to cut the remaining ties he had to Britain, and it became his de facto home for the rest of his life. It was from Monaco that he could look back on his international life and begin working on The Prince of the Power of the Air the novel that would later become Earthly Powers. The novel tells the story of renowned writer Kenneth Toomey and his relationship with Don Carlo Campanati, a Catholic priest destined for the papacy. The novel is also a history of the 20th century, with Toomey bearing witness to several key events, including the death of the British Empire, the Holocaust, and the obscenity trials of the 1960s. Despite basing Toomey on Somerset Maugham and describing his division from the Catholic Church because of his homosexuality, Burgess's international life can be seen in almost every chapter. Take, for instance, this early scene. I took a cigarette for myself for the Florentine leather-bound box on the counter. There was also a huge wooden bowl from Central Africa full of matchbooks, trophies of the world's airlines and hotels. I had toyed once with the notion of writing a travel book arranged on the aleatory taking out of matchbooks from this bowl, rather like filthy Norman Douglas's autobiography based on a random selection of visiting cards. It had come to nothing. There is a sense, however, in keeping a bowl full of such trophies. There are addresses and telephone numbers there, as well as a palpable record of travel helpful to an old man's memory. I lighted my cigarette with a match from Le Grand Seine, a restaurant on the top of the Kennedy Center in Washington, 8338870. I could not for the life of me remember ever having been there. The archive at the International Anthony Burgess Foundation has this collection of matchbooks including the one from Le Grand Seine. It proves to be a record of Burgess's international life, a life that made much of his fiction possible. It can be seen overtly in his books about the East, the Malayan trilogy and Devil of a State, and it influenced his writing of Napoleon Symphony, MF, Tremor of Intent and even A Clockwork Orange. In fact, the vast majority of his novels are influenced by his international experience. It is clear that none of these books would have existed in the same form if Burgess had remained in England. However, it is in earthly powers that Burgess takes full advantage of his international status, carefully interweaving his own history with that of Kenneth Toomey and gracefully examining a world whose cohesion has been irreparably damaged by the accelerated and fractured culture of the 20th century. But Burgess, like Toomey, remained English underneath his international exterior. When it was his time to take his final journey, he did so from London, thus bringing him back to a sort of home, something that would have moved Toomey to tears. Home. Another of those damned emotive words. I must give up on seeing people, I told myself, sniffing the tears back. All the old bitch can do these days is lay on the weepy weepies, self-pity, you know. I doubt if I'll see England again, I said. The International Anthony Burgess Foundation podcast was written and narrated by Graham Foster. Readings were by Ben Jewell and Adam Uray. All music was composed by Anthony Burgess. For more information, visit www.anthonyburgess.org.
www.anthonyburgess.org.